Okay, so today I will introduce you to the Song of Songs, which will be our first reading. Um, but before I can do that, I'm going, before I go straight into the Song of Songs, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the family of books to which belongs in, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, let me make sure everyone's muted really quick. Okay, um, right, because if we don't understand this, genre of books or this family of books we're going to miss as many commentators have we're going to miss the real meaning of the song of songs right so we have to situate it within a family of books which are kind of like-minded and then we can really understand what the text is telling us so uh so uh let's let me ask this question um how many of you know how the hebrew bible is divided into how many sections and what are the three sections does anybody know this I'm putting you on gallery view to see if there's any geniuses among us. Who knows what are the three main sections of the Hebrew Bible and what are their names? <clears throat> and if you know, please speak up. <laughs> so we don't have to wait for ages. Nobody knows? All right. I shall tell you. All right. So what I mean by the Hebrew Bible is the Old Testament, right? For Okay, we got an answer <laughs> from Bella, right? So Hebrew Bible doesn't include the Gospels, right? It's a Jewish Bible. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's mostly the Old Testament, and it is made up of three main sections. You have, um, as uh, Bella mentioned, the five books of Moses, the prophets, and wisdom literature, like she said in the chat. Um, hold on, one of you can't hear me. No, <laughs> I don't know what you should do. <laughs> uh, hopefully you'll fix this problem. Okay, so, um, so our text belongs to the wisdom literature. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about these books. So in, in this wisdom literature, you have the following books. You have the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. You have the book of Ecclesiastes. You have our book, the Song of Songs. And you have a few more, but I'm going to just stick. You have the book of Job. Right. I'm going to stick with these four for now. Okay. So uh, just get an idea of the class. How many of you are familiar with the Hebrew Bible? Just put your hand on the screen. I can see you in the. Okay. So about half of you. Okay. So you, I'm not speaking complete Chinese. <laughs> All right. Very good. So these particular books, these wisdom books, have actually a very different atmosphere than the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and in fact, they have such a different atmosphere that a lot of the clergy, the rabbis, or the pastors or priests have actually not really dealt into these books, right? These books actually have been somewhat marginalized. In fact, for this reason, I have called them the lost and forgotten books. I'm going to put this in the chat uh, of the Hebrew Bible, right? These are rarely going to be commented on or taught in a, in a church or in a synagogue, right? If you go to a church, hardly ever right? You will hear mostly about the Gospels. You'll hear about, you know, some of the Old Testament, but very rarely will you hear anything from the book of Ecclesiastes, except maybe a quote, right? Uh, same with the book of Job. If you go in the context of Judaism, to be fair, uh, they teach these books maybe once a year, right? Song of Songs is read every week, uh, Ecclesiastes once a year, but still, if you go to a synagogue, mostly you will be hearing every week from the prophets or from the five books of Moses. Right, so there's a quick question. Um, so, Hakimian, I'm referring to the wisdom books of the Hebrew Bible um, as listed above Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Book of Job. Right, these are the philosophical books of the Bible. Okay, so there is a reason, right, why the clergy tend to want to repress these books, right? Uh, what I mean by clergy, I'm going to refer to them a lot, is basically the religious teachers, right? Whether we're talking about uh, rabbis. Did I spell clergy right? No. Oh, why? Why? <laughs> That's insane. I forgot how to spell clergy. <laughs> okay. Right. When I talk about the clergy, I mean the religious teachers in general, whether it's the pastors, the priests, or the rabbis, right? Same kind of attitude. They tend to neglect these books, right? These books are not usually taught. So in this class, we're going to have the pleasure to study one of these books. Um, but before we do that, we have to understand the general atmosphere and why these books have been somewhat banned, right? Uh, and why the clergy don't really want to teach them, right? Uh, there are three main reasons, right? These books are very different from the rest of the Hebrew Bible. There's three main reasons which we're going to study. I'm going to write them all down and then we'll talk about it. 
First of all, these books are anthropocentric, meaning they're human-centered. Human-centered. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, they're universal. Number three, they are subversive. Okay, so make sure you jot down these three points. And let me remind you, right, to write your notes as detailed as possible. This will be helpful for you for the test. Just make sure you get anything that I'm, especially things that I'm writing into the chat need to be in your notes, <laughs> right? Okay, so let's look a little bit at what it means that these books are human-centered. So to do this, I'm gonna ask you the following question. When you read the five books of Moses, right? This is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. Um, who is doing most of the talking? Uh, let's see if any one of you has an idea. Who is talking most of the time in Genesis, Exodus? So who is the one taking center stage in these books? <clears throat> So I need y'all to respond, guys. <laughs> I'm not gonna wait five minutes each time for you to answer. We're gonna take forever. So if you know the answer, just put it in the chat. You don't wanna talk. <laughs> okay, thank you, Michelle. So Moses is writing, but he is in a way writing the voice of someone. Who is doing, as Moses is writing, right? Who is doing most of the speaking? Who is the person doing most of the speaking? God? Yes, very good, Lo. Okay, or whoever it was. <laughs> right. yes. Okay, thank you, Suleiman. All right, very good, right? And Lo also says the same. It's excellent, right? When you look at the five books of Moses, most of the person who takes center stage is God, right? In fact, when you read the first pages, you go to the book of Genesis, which uh, narrates the Genesis 1, right? Narrates the creation of the world. You have God at the center. Uh, it goes like this, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, Right? And then you have seven words of God, and each time he speaks, the world comes into being, um, and so forth. And then it continues, you have the first humans, and then you have, and God spoke, right, to Abraham, and God spoke to Isaac, and God spoke. So God is really, then later in the book of Exodus, you have God laying down the law, right? So God, again, is speaking from Mount Sinai, he's giving his law. So he's really, God is doing most of the talking in the five books of Moses. Now, <laughs> trick question. In the prophets, who is doing most of the speaking? In the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, who is doing most of the speaking? Be careful, it's a trick question. <laughs> okay, so the prophets, but the prophets are speaking whose word? Or whose words? Exactly, exactly, right? They're speaking, but they're, they begin everything they say. They begin, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. So still God, right? So God is really taking over, right? His voice is booming forth through the Hebrew Bible in general, except when you get to the wisdom books, right? When it comes to the wisdom books, all of a sudden God recedes in the background. It's very strange, right? He's not speaking anymore. In fact, he's not even there. And who takes center stage? Human beings. Right, so the first thing you write for human centered is that when you read these books, God is practically inexistent, He is mentioned in passing, in idiosyncratic uh, or idiomatic expressions, but He's not at the center. Right, God is in the backstage, He's not speaking, He's not laying down the law. Instead, you have human beings talking to each other. Right, that's the main difference in terms of human centric, right? Human centered. So, for example, the book of Proverbs. You have a father and a son in dialogue, right? The father is teaching his son. In the book of Ecclesiastes, you have a monologue. In the book of Job, you have several dialogues. Uh, God does come in at one point, but in general, it's human beings. And then son of sons, man and woman talking to each other, right? Okay, so that's the first feature. So one can already understand here the clergy is like, well, I'm not going to teach these books because I want to teach the word of God, right? I want to teach revelation. I don't want to teach, you know, some poems or some monologue, right? So a lot of the priests or pastors and so forth tend to think, well, you know, I want to focus on God's word, right? So I'm going to avoid these books. And, and in doing so, we're going to see they miss something fundamental, right? The, the Bible without these books is not the same. It's not the same God, right? Okay. So that's the first thing. Now, if you go look into what these uh, people are talking about, it becomes very interesting. Um, for those of you who've read those books, what are these people talking about in general? Are they talking about worship, about, you know, legalities of the law? Are they talking about rituals? What are they talking about mostly? Anybody know? <clears throat> well, they talk about how, um, how you're supposed to be and how it's like a guide, guideline to how you should live life. 
Okay, very good. Suleiman, by the way, we want to see your beautiful face, just so you know. My camera's not working for some reason. I tried with the with my other laptop too. I think it's the Wi-Fi. Ah, okay, that's all right. Okay, very good, right? Suleiman is right, right? What is going on in these books are human beings talking about human issues, right? They're not worried about sacrifices and rituals and prayers and, you know, hymns. They are worried about life. And so in these books, you're going to be dealing with themes that are very interesting in terms of human life in general. You're talking about uh, pleasure, love, wisdom, despair, how to face death, how to face light, uh, suffering. Very good, Paul, right? This is, these are very human topics dealt with in a human way. Human beings are not quoting scripture, right, in these books. They're not looking at the law. They're just expressing or thinking, figuring things out on their own without a reference to the divine. It's very interesting, right? So you can already see the discomfort, right, on this first level of the clergy here are human beings talking about human issues, not even quoting scripture, right? They're just thinking it out or expressing it out. So it's very strange, right? In the middle of the Hebrew Bible to have this moment, right? Okay. Second aspect, universal. Now this becomes, it gets worse, by the way, progressively, <laughs> right? So universal is very interesting because when you read these books carefully, you get the distinct sense that the target audience is not a religious audience. In other words, these books are written with a language that is very secular, that is very worldly, that is very philosophical. Uh, when you read especially the books of Solomon, like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, it's, it's laden with uh, allusions to Egyptian thought, right? These are books written clearly for a secular audience, for an audience which is philosophical, intellectual, Right. And so the target audience is clearly not believers. Right. The target audience is what the Hebrews call the nations. Right. Not the Hebrews, but the nations around that surround the, the kingdom of Israel. In other words, these books have been written for us. Right. In other words, all of us, especially if we're not Jewish or Christian, we actually have an inheritance within the Hebrew Bible. There is a section of books that were written for the nations for the secular world, for the non-believing world, for the pagan world, right? Um, so yes, of course, Hakimian, the religious people can read these books, but I would venture to argue that if you are religious, you will have a harder time understanding these books than someone who is secular minded, right? Because often when we have a religious mindset, it's difficult to take that off and enter our full humanity, right? Which some of us can do that, right? Some of us can take off the religious garments and blend with humanity. But a lot of us, we get shocked. We get disturbed by the very often subversive content of these books, right? I want to emphasize this will be the third point, but these books are also very subversive with regards to the dominant religious worldview. So a religious person has a harder time because these books are constantly picking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Universal is for the secular world? Yes, that's the second one. Yes. Right. Does that answer your question, uh, Hakim Yan? Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay, very good. Right. So, so clearly, right, these books have a target audience beyond the walls of Jerusalem, right? The target audience are the nations, target audience is us, right? So all of us in the class actually have an inheritance within the Hebrew Bible, right? And it will be, like I said, harder for somebody with a religious background to feel at ease. We will see this very soon as we enter the Song of Songs, right? Now, in addition to this, right, the fact that um, the target audience is, is broader, there are two main reasons, two main arguments for this, right? First of all, I'm going to write it down. It has to do with the protagonists. Uh, let me write this down. All right, let me use an easier word, the characters of the stories, and B, the authors. Right, so when so I'm still under universal, right? I'm uh, I'm looking at what is making them universal. Oh, there's one more thing. Let's see the themes, right? So these so I've just uh, so there are three reasons, right, why these books are so universal, why they give the impression, right, of being universal. Number one, the authors. So sorry, the characters. When you look at these books, a lot of the main characters are not Jewish, right? They are coming from the nations. For example, the Book of Job is not particularly Jewish. He's just a normal patriarch living in the desert. He could be anyone. 
right? He could be a Jew, he could be a Palestinian, he could be an Arab, he could be an Egyptian. Uh, we don't know. He's a generic old man living in the desert, right? So Job already, right? Um, very non, uh, very generic, right? Now, uh, when you go to the Song of Songs, which we'll meet in a second, main character, woman, not Jewish, right? We're going to see how she describes herself as being dark-skinned. Right? So a lot of commentators speculate that this is a woman coming from the South, from possibly uh, the African uh, continent, right? because she's so different racially right? from people around her. She's in fact shunned for her dark skin, nothing new. <laughs> right? So at the beginning of time, it seems. Right? So, so she, the main character, she is the main character. She's the one doing most of the speaking. She controls the relationship. We're going to see this, right? And she's not Jewish, right? She's going to be teaching us from a place outside, right, of Jerusalem. Okay, so we have characters, right, are, are not Jewish. The authors, now this is interesting. This is my favorite part because when you go to the authors of these books, you have um, uh, particularly the books of uh, the book of Proverbs. I, I, I always talk about this because this is so funny to me. Um, but to understand this, you need to understand a little bit of the history of Israel. So if, brief history 101. <laughs> so if you recall, right, the, the Hebrews started with uh, Abraham and then the descendants of Abraham moved to Egypt and there they became a nation. And then they moved back, right, into the, they, they started to migrate back into the land of Israel, present day Israel. Uh, and of course, when they started to migrate back, the land was not empty, right? There were people living there. Now, anybody know the names of these people? Let's see how many of you know your Bible. <laughs> Anybody know the names of the people who were there populating? Very good, Hakimian, the Canaanites, okay? Sounds very, uh, very brutal, <laughs> Canaanites, right? So now, Canaanites are described uh, in the book of Exodus, who is written by Moses, right? Described as ruthless, violent, bloodthirsty tribes, right? Who needed to be wiped out because they were so corrupt and so disgusting, right? So when Moses is writing about them, you have a very bleak picture right, uh, of, of these tribes. Now, interestingly, knowing this, right, so remember, these were the tribes that were so morally depraved that God had ordered the Hebrews, according to the writings of Moses, to destroy them, annihilate them completely. Now, having said that, when you go to the book of Proverbs, you go to the few last Proverbs. Anybody know where the author of these few last Proverbs came from? Take a wild guess. <laughs> You can already guess. Based Israel. On. What did you say, Suleiman? Israel. Nope. <laughs> so the main author, right, is uh, Solomon, right? He's writing, but then towards the end, he adds a few more uh, po uh, proverbs from other writers. These writers are not from Israel. Where are they from, do you think? <laughs> Canaan. Very good, Dali, right? Canaanite authors have written, these guys who were supposed to be so depraved, they had to be annihilated, they're actually taking part in the writing of the Jewish scripture. Uh, and you can check, just verify, especially the famous proverb 31 that is read every Friday night in Jewish households to bless the woman. That proverb was actually written by a Canaanite sage, right? So this is already very shocking, right? That you have these members of these vicious tribes contributing, right, to the Hebrew Bible, to the scriptures, right? Okay, and then you have, um, uh, in general, right, when you look at, at the writings, especially of the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, still Solomon authoring these books, you have a whole number of allusions to Egyptian thought, right? In fact, throughout these texts, any text that Solomon has written, like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, you will have a strong Egyptian influence. And so now we have Egyptian worldview, right? Entering these texts. Now remember, who was Egypt? Anybody know? Was it a friend of Israel? <laughs> friendly or not friendly, Egypt? No, no, exactly, Hakimian. Egypt was the oppressor. They were the ones who oppressed, right, the, the children of Israel for 400 years. And now here is Egypt popping up in the scripture. Are you, are you seeing what I'm seeing? This is insane, 
right? Here you have these texts in the middle of the Hebrew Bible where you have an African princess or an African woman, you have a Canaanite sage, you have an Egyptian philosopher, and then you have the Hebrew author bringing these voices into the text, right? So we'll talk about why he does that in a second, right? But you can already see in the authors, in the, in the characters, there is a strong universality, right? People from the outside are invited to write, to think, to take part of the revelation process, right? Okay, now, so this was interesting, right, uh, about the book of Proverbs, to have the, the sworn foe and enemy of Israel contributed, right? Now, we get to, so again, right, you can sense how if you're a member of the clergy, and you're reading and you're seeing all this Egyptian, Canaanite and African stuff, you're gonna be like, I'm not teaching that. <laughs> right? I wanna teach Hebrew, like, you know, the pure, the, the, the religious, the chosen, right? Why should I go and, and get these, why should I bring in these guys, right? These, so, so a lot of the clergy hesitate to talk about these texts simply because these texts are so foreign. There are so many foreign elements in these texts, right? There are so many non-Hebrew elements, pagan elements, and they're worried, right? So that's another reason why they prefer to, you know, let's just do the five books of Moses and the Gospels, right? Okay, now it gets worse. Subversive, right? Subversive means rebellious, right? So there is also a strong rebellious streak in these books, and I'll give you a few examples. In other words, what I mean by rebellious is that in many ways, these books go against the dominant worldview of the Hebrew Bible. In other words, when you look at the five books of Moses, when you look at the prophets, there is a certain worldview. There is a certain way you should live, think, act, right? These books come along, they destroy everything. Don't think like that. Don't act like that. Don't live like that. Here's a different way, right? Uh, I've called these books actually the gospels, the gospel of the lost sheep, <laughs> um, or the gospel of those who have wandered off the path, <laughs> right? Because they are so, they're, they're paving a different path, right? Literally, they're showing us a different way to be human, a different way to be spiritual, a different vision of God even, right? So, so you have the mainstream vision of God, mainstream path, but then you have these books, right? Making little uh, trails in the mountains, in the deserts that no one has walked before that is giving us alternative path to being human, to being spiritual, right? So this is, so that's why I call these the gospel of the lost sheep or the gospel or, or the, the, you know, the scripture of those who have wandered off the path, right? Um, okay, so let me give you an example. So when you go to the book of Job, you have first main um, <clears throat> subversion, right? So uh, it has to do with suffering, right? Now, when you read uh, the, the five books of Moses, when do people suffer according to the five books of Moses? When, what, what, why, what is the reason that people will suffer according to uh, the book of Deuteronomy, for example, or the books of Moses? What is the reason people suffer according to that worldview? Anybody remember? Okay, very good, right? Right? It's a result of sin. You did something wrong. You didn't follow God. And so now here you are reaping the consequences of your sin, right? Now, when you get to the book of Job, you have a complete reversal because here you have a man who is extremely pious, extremely religious to the dot, right? And yet, this is the man that God targets to destroy, right? So you have a complete reversal. In the book of Job, you realize that suffering is not necessarily a result of sin. It could be a result of righteousness, <laughs> right? Complete reversal, right? Um, it gets worse. When you get to the book of Ecclesiastes, you have there a man who basically is saying, if everybody dies, that's the thesis of the book. If everybody dies, then what's the point of me being righteous? Because in the end, I will end up in the grave next to Al Capone. You know Al Capone? <laughs> or next to some gangster or next to... Right, Ecclesiastes, I, I mentioned it above in the list of the uh, books. If you go up the chat, you have all the books listed. Um, at the end. Um, okay, uh, so yes, so, so, so the, the main character of the book of Ecclesiastes is saying, uh, in, in the Hebrew, for those of you who have a Jewish background, it's Kohelet, right? When I say Ecclesiastes, it's also, um, uh, in the Hebrew, it's Kohelet for those of you who are lost. Okay, so he's basically saying, if everybody dies, then what's the point? Why should I be good? Why should I suffer? Why should I deprive myself? Let me be a big 
thug like the rest of them and and i will enjoy myself in this life instead of you know killing myself to be righteous this is basically the thesis of the book goes against everything else right everything the hebrew bible teaches that the meaning of life is to serve god to be righteous because the right thing to do ecclesiastes is like i don't see the point <laughs> right basically overturning everything and then we'll see our song the song of songs is extremely subversive and i'm gonna save it for a special or maybe i could do it now um yeah let me do it now song of songs extremely subversive for several reasons and we're going to see that in the text right so it's a love story where remember i mentioned the woman is the one who controls the relationship right so this begins already First thing you see in the Song of Songs, uh, actually, let me ask you this. Anybody know who is the first person to speak in the Song of Songs? Who is the one who begins the whole thing? Anybody know? If you've tried to read it already? <clears throat> Solomon? Who? Solomon? No, no, Solomon is just the author. <laughs> it's a dialogue, right, between two people. Solomon is not there. <laughs> Play the woman. What? The woman. Yes, very good, right? Say, uh, likewise, Bella, right? The woman starts, right? So this is really strange. She starts now. She doesn't even start like she's supposed to start, right? With humility and grace. She starts by making a proposition, right? She starts, she basically, how do you do, say this in English? Um, she's basically flirting or worse. Um, give me a word when you're flirting too much. Anybody has a word like that in English? When you're overdoing it, you're, you're like almost flashy. Anybody have a word for that? She's coming on to the guy. Scandalous. Go ahead, yes. Scandalous. Yeah, she's scandalous. She, she's coming on to this guy in a way that is not appropriate, right, for a woman at the time. Instead of, you know, hiding in her father's household and waiting for everything to be arranged, she comes out into the street and she proposes to this guy and she begins the book by saying, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth for your lips are sweeter than honey, right? So she's making a sexual proposition to this guy from the beginning. No courtship, nothing, right? Uh, Hakinian, what is this forward you're talking about? Um, like when someone is very, ah, forward, oh. they like, <laughs> yes, yes, she's yeah. very forward in a, in a very scandalous way, right? Which is not how the woman's supposed to ask. That's the first thing. She takes the lead and then she's the one doing most of the speaking. That's another thing which in the patriarchal culture is not usually the case, right? Second thing, they are, now that you, some of you will love this in Queens because I know that you fall in love often with people that are not your own religion and you have all kinds of problems <laughs> when you do, right? This is exactly a Queens love story because the two of them are a different race, they're a different religion. The man is a Hebrew, the woman is an African. Um, I mean, possibly, right? We don't know for sure anything, but she really seems to be coming from a different racial background. They probably don't share the same faith. She feels all the time shunned by everybody in the city. So she's clearly a foreigner. She's an outsider, right? And here you have this mixed relationship, which is not supposed to happen, right? There are laws in the Hebrew culture which say you will not marry someone from these pagan lands. You will marry a good Jew, right? So second thing, right? So make sure you write these. The first thing is the woman takes the lead. Number two, it's a mixed, right? interracial interreligious interethnic right relationship and now the worst one number three number three is they are breaking all the rules possible and imaginable that have been set carefully around courtship they break all those rules let me give you an example <laughs> So technically woman is supposed to be the way it was done in patriarchal culture right the woman was at home if, if you fell in love because you caught a glimpse of her in the window, right, you would not go to her, you would go to the father, make a business arrangement, make sure you have enough money, the father would say yes, you might meet her or not, right, you would get married properly and then you could sleep with her and have, you know, have a family and so forth. Now, in this story, everything goes wrong, right, number one, there's no father, not mentioned, only parent mentioned is the mother who seems in fact to be sympathetic to the relationship since the woman is bringing her lover to her mother's house no father so we are clearly outside the patriarchal norms right number two 
uh, there is no courtship, no nothing. They are clearly very quickly um, together in a physical sense, right? Without there being a proper marriage, a proper, you know, gathering, a proper oath. They are clearly already, <laughs> right, doing it, <laughs> right, in the pastures, in the prairies, in the villages, right? They go to these remote places together. Why? <laughs> right? So we already have it's I mean everything is subtle in the text, right? We we can never be sure of anything, but it's it's um it's subtle enough that you can imagine quite a lot is going on between these two people, right? Without there being the proper boundary of marriage. So this is already shocking, right? Um so these are the three main, right, very, very subversive content. And we start to wonder, like, why are we going to study this book, which is full of, you know, um, breaking the rules is well, how is this going to help us to know how to love right i mean we want to learn some rules around here there's a book that circulated for a while in new york called the rules i don't know if you heard about it <laughs> and it was basically how you could as a woman ensure that the person you're dating marries you within six months <laughs> if you follow these rules this book is breaking all the rules okay so we should be prepared for this right i'm preparing you already a question I heard a voice. Okay. I have right. a question. Was that book written by um, a Jew, a re religious Jew with the six months? No, no, that's written by a woman, uh, not, not Jewish, I don't think. <laughs> it was surprising. I was, uh, I was at a shewer with a dating coach and he was like, you shouldn't be dating more than six months or else it's all games. And so it made me think of that. Yep, she's certainly coming from that tradition from another yeah. direction, but she's saying the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely. You can buy the book. It's everywhere. It's called The Rules. It was very, very popular for a while. Um, excellent. So, okay, so now we're, we're, I think you're entering the climate, right? Hopefully you're starting to see, if you're a kind of anarchist person, you're going to love these books because these books are just, ah, you know, they're just exploding. All the categories, all the structures, they are books that are very free, very wild. They're... You know, so this is kind of the climate, which we have to understand is the climate of the wisdom books. If we don't understand this climate, you will come into the Song of Songs and you will start to misread it. If you read the Song of Songs from a religious perspective, trying to find their rules, regulations, right? It's not gonna work. So that's not the point of the book, right? Okay, I'm sure a few of you are already uncomfortable, which is good because these books are supposed to make you uncomfortable. Okay. So now, a uh, quick question before we go further into the actual Song of Songs. Um, why do you think, right, given these three points, human-centered, universal, subversive, why do you think these books still made it in the canon, right, in the scripture? Why do you think they haven't been taken out? Anybody can tell me why you think these books may still remained, are important? In other words, what would the Hebrew religion look like, or the Hebrew scripture look like without these books? Let's hear a little bit of you on this. You can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, it's better if you raise your hand before talking so that way no, no one is talking at the same time. Hakimia, go ahead. Uh, maybe they were uh, interpreted in a certain way that was, um, that didn't defy or like wasn't subversive to the, to the traditional thought. So yeah, definitely, Hakimian, these books were interpreted in a way to tone them down and kosherize them, right? That's for sure. Song of Songs, actually, they did it particularly well in the Song of Songs because they said, ah, it's not a poem between God, uh, a man and a woman. It's a poem between God and his people. And so now they're interpreting all the erotic components like the kiss, right? They say, no, oh, no, no, that's a sacred kiss, right? The Christians also give a few really fun interpretations, right? When they, when they uh, or the also Jewish scholars. So, so it's, they, they really try to tone things down. But when you read the books at face value, it's difficult to get around the universal, the subversive, and the uh, human-centered character, right? So I'm going to take in the class the books at face value, right? Like they were written. Uh, Suleiman, go ahead. Um, I think that when reading these books, people can relate to them. And I, with philosophy, there are so many different ways you could look at the script and you refer to your own life with it you know what I mean because it philosophy can go in many different ways it depends on how you interpret it and based on your life I feel like that's how you'll interpret the script 
Okay, so, excellent, right? These books are written so they can resonate with our humanity, right? We can feel at home in these books, especially if we don't come from a religious context. We feel like, oh, they're going through what I'm going through. They understand, right? So very good. I see a couple in the chat. I see Kaikov. Yes, it will look too perfect for people to believe, right? If you have too perfect ideal, people can't relate to it, right? And then you have uh, Mushel. Maybe it's to make comparison to what Jewish life is not like. Yes, definitely, <laughs> right? They're clearly, uh, but they are still Jewish books, right? We can't just ban them. They're part of what it means to be a believer and so forth, even though they were written for the nations, right? So any other reasons why you, any other reasons why you think these books are fundamental, need to be preserved and protected like, uh, you know, like an environment that is about to be extinct? <laughs> okay. Uh, one way, one reason, uh, oh yes, Hakimian, go ahead. <laughs> um, maybe like because of history, like to preserve the history, the historical aspect of it, just because like it was a truth of the time. Okay, yes, definitely. You can see it as a truth of the time, although the scripture usually wants to be a truth for all times, right? <laughs> but definitely, yes, you have this, these preserve this text, right? Any other reason before I go into my, uh, my interpretation? Um, okay, good. All right. So, uh, yes, I see one more. Everyone can relate to it. Okay, so a lot of you are saying that, right? These are books that are relatable. These are books that show what it means to be truly human and to struggle with life, right? And so forth. So I, I want to add to that, right? These books are really written. I, I want to emphasize that, right? Um, in order to pave a second path, right? You have the path, make sure you write this down, right? You have the, the path of the righteous, virtuous people who follow the rules. This is definitely a path that works. I can guarantee you, if you follow the rules, you will make it. You will be happy. This is a good path to take. But there are certain human beings who can't do that, right? Certain human beings just can't walk. They can't obey. They can't walk the line. And so what is left for them? These books, right? These books are written, like I told you, for those who are off the path, who can't follow the rules, who can't follow directions, right? Who have to make mistake upon mistake to learn. And so they have also been given a Bible, right? This is the Bible for those who refuse to follow, for those who cannot obey and submit, right? This is also a text which can show them that, yes, you are on that path, but that path also can lead you somewhere, right? And here is how. Morissette, go ahead. Speak to us, Morissette. Like, isn't it also a way for them to show us that despite, because let, let's just say that way. I'm, I'm Christian, so I, that's my, that's how I would understand that before there was always war like people were always fighting and everything but they had to show us that despite all the struggle there were still people loving each other like real love was still being around because until now we're still gonna have wars we're still gonna have people dying but we have to understand despite this going on people are still able to to express love for each other like real love something just war like there's no, there's no trying to hide anything. We just love two people loving each other and trying to survive through all of it. Okay, Maurice said, I think you really understand the text, right? This is exactly what the text is talking about. Instead of being about all the rules and regulations and rituals, this text is saying what really matters is love. If you can love, you're good, right? And it's true that, uh, and by the way, you, you mentioned Christianity. Um, these books are the most Christian texts of the Hebrew Bible because when you read the Gospels, you have the same kind of rebellious, subversive teaching in the mouth of Jesus, right? Jesus is also saying the law is not what really matters. What matters is your heart, right? So very clearly these books and, and the texts of the Gospels especially are connected. They're saying pretty much the same thing. They, they're saying, let's get back to the basics, right? What does it mean to love? And that's why this particular book, by the way, was um, considered to be the holy of holies, right? In the Hebrew tradition, because it teaches the only thing that really matters, right? So excellent, Maurice. 
Um, by the way, don't worry guys about assignments and everything. I'm going to have some time after the lecture and, we, and I'm going to answer all those questions. So, so just focus on the material right now and I will answer, I will, we will be talking about assignments um, at the end. Okay. Um, okay, very good. Now to add to what Marissa was saying, um, there's another reason why these books are so important, even though they're so different and, and subversive and even though they clash right, with the dominant worldview. And the reason for this is that, uh, to understand this, we have to understand um, the kind of religion that the Hebrew religion is trying to uh, teach. This is what we call a covenant religion. So let me explain. So the covenant religion is, a covenant is the same word as a marriage, right? In other words, um, if you really want, in a nutshell, what is the message of the Hebrew Bible? In a nutshell, it is this. Everything that is written, all the stories, all the laws, all the rituals have just one purpose. It is to weave a relationship between the divine and the human. That's the main point of the Hebrew Bible. How do we bring the two together? And so all the stories, all the laws, all the wisdom, all of everything is all about creating this connection, right? So you have, so the whole, so very differently from other religions where you have a relationship of submission, right? You, you're supposed to submit to God. In the Hebrew religion, if you're married, right, if it is a covenant or a marriage relationship, the, the relationship is different than submission, right? In other words, the relationship is one of equality. So if one says something, the other one can also say something, right? If one thinks we should do this, the other one can also say, well, yeah, I think we should do that too, and something else, right? So in fact, the sign of a dysfunctional relationship is when only one person is doing all the talking and all the deciding. A real relationship, you have both putting in their grain of salt. This is why these books are so important. We saw that God is, is in control in all of the Hebrew Bible, but here, in these texts, you have the human response to the divine word. Okay, let me say it again, right? In these texts, so you can write it down, you have the human response to the divine word. In other words, there is a space created here for our humanity to respond. And we don't always have to respond, you know, in a submissive way. You have a lot of rebellion, you have a lot of bitterness, you have a lot of joy, you have a lot of uh, uh, pleasure, but you also have a lot of anger and you have a lot of doubt, right? And so you have a lot of questions, right? So you have this whole space given for humanity to express itself in response to the divine word. And now you therefore have, the, the, the idea is that a true spiritual connection does not obliterate the human dimension. Now I'm going to tell you a story to illustrate that, but first let me see the comment from Daily. Common religions based on agreement. Yeah, it's like a marriage contract, right? Um, so yes, you have an agreement, but both in a way have responsibilities and both especially have a voice, right? It's not a submission, right? The marriage is an equality, and that's what we have in the Hebrew Bible. Now let me, let me tell you a story to illustrate this, right? Okay, so first I need to uh, know if all of you know these two characters. How many of you uh, know uh, Noah, the character Noah? Put your hand in the screen. Okay, great. How many of you know Abraham? Put your hand in the screen. Okay, great. Okay, so I can make the story now. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you don't know Noah, you can watch the, the movie with uh, Russell Crowe <laughs> on the flood. Was it called Noah? Or was it called The Ark? What was the name of that movie? Anybody remember? I think it was The Flood. Oh, um, Noah. Noah. Okay, yes. So if you don't know who Noah is, tonight you can watch a very good movie uh, called Noah with Russell Crowe. Uh, and Abraham, most of us know, right? Okay, so this is a story told in the Talmud. So let me write down that word. Uh, in the Talmud, just to explain, these are all the commentaries of the rabbis on the Hebrew Bible. On the Hebrew Bible. So this is their discussions, right? They're reading the Hebrew Bible and they're discussing. They're asking questions, they're studying, and all of these discussions are compiled in a very large, several volume work called the Talmud. Um, a rabbi, just for those who don't know, is a, is, a, is a Jewish religious teacher. Okay, now we're clear. Okay, so this is a story in the Talmud. So the story goes like this. There's a bunch of rabbis got together and they're like, ah, let's, let's study together. Let's do a little bit of studying together. It's going to be fun. It's going to be our, our vacation. Okay, so they start and they say, we're going to start at the beginning of the Bible and go till the end. 
So they're studying, they're happy. They get to the story of Noah within the, which chapter, five or something of Genesis. And at that point, they get very discouraged. They're like, oh, I don't like this story. I don't like this guy, right? They start to hate and resent Noah. They're so angry at Noah. They even want to stop the whole project. They're like, oh, we're not studying this anymore. We hate this guy. So, you know, they're like, okay, look, let's continue. Let's give the Bible a chance, <laughs> right? So they continue and they get to the story of Abraham. And at that moment, ah, oh, they burst into song. They're so happy. Ah, oh, we love Abraham. He's so much better than that loser Noah, right? And they start to drink at the, at the health of Abraham. You know, they're drinking and they're dancing. They're so happy, right? And so that's the story, right? So my question to you is, why do you think the rabbis despise Noah so much but loved Abraham? What did no one do so bad that Abraham did so better? Anybody know? <laughs> it's a hard question. Most of you never get it. <laughs> Some of you know. Let me help you. What was the main event with Noah? And especially, how did Noah react when God told him about this? <laughs> Look at the that. flood. Mm -hmm. And how did he react when God said, oh, I'm going to do a flood. I just wanted you to know. Uh, how does Noah react? Doesn't he try to get the bad people to, to be good? I believe he does it a few times, but then they don't listen to him, and then the flood came. So what you're saying is found in the tradition, but not in the scripture. <laughs> in the scripture, doesn't talk to anybody. <laughs> the scripture, what does he do? in the actual text of the Hebrew Bible. What's the first thing he does? <laughs> what is he known for? What was his big project? He built an ark. Okay, good. Who went into the ark? Him and his family. Okay, anything wrong with this picture? That he didn't include the people. Okay, very good, right? Uh, unlike what you're saying, Dali, be careful. He didn't try to get God to give the people a chance. Nothing! If you read the text, right, a lot of you are informed by the tradition, which weaves, you know, fills in the gaps. But when you read the actual text, watch this. God comes to Abraham, uh, sorry, Noah, and says, I'm going to destroy the world. And Noah is like, okay, <laughs> what do you want me to do? And build an ark. Okay. He builds an ark. Who's going to, you and your family. Okay. No objection. It's at business as usual. Now, look at the story of Abraham, same scenario. Anybody remember a similar story where God is talking to Abraham and saying, I'm going to destroy something. Anybody remember? He was going to kill, I think, his, uh, his like, village or people. Yes, not his village, the neighboring one. The famous cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, right, that we all hear about. Where he talks to God and he says, like, uh, if at least like 50% of these people are good people, will you not destroy it? And then he checked and not even 50% of them were, were good. So he tried to keep going down in the percentage. And then I think it was like 10%, 5%, something like that. But then he ended up destroying it anyway. Exactly. It was only his friend Lot and Lot did escape. He what? Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. Only his nephew, right? Exactly. Now watch this, right? Very different from Noah. God comes to Abraham, says, hey, by the way, I, I, I just wanted to tell you, these two cities over there, I'm about to destroy them. And, and, and Abraham is shocked. Thank God, right? Finally, somebody displaying a little bit of solidarity. Abraham is so shocked and appalled. And he says, God, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, you know, is this a good idea? Have you thought about it? Have you had breakfast? Can I give you some breakfast? Maybe you have some low blood sugar and you're not functioning, right? So he's very, very disturbed. And so he starts to bargain with God. What if there are 50 righteous people? Are you going to destroy the city? And God is like, no, no, you have a point, you have a point. I wouldn't do that, he says. And so Abraham, he knows the cities very well. He knows there is not 50 righteous people. So he goes down 40, 30, 20, 10. And at that moment, the rabbis begin to weep again. Because perhaps had Abraham bargained until zero, God might have spared the cities. In the end, there is not 10 people. God doesn't spare the cities, but he saves the remaining six, I think, people who are still good, right? So do you see the difference between Abraham and Noah? Noah is submissive. Noah takes every word from God and obeys, right? Abraham, on the other hand, has the nerve and the audacity to question 
and to talk back and to disagree with God. And now who is considered God's friend between the two? Anybody know who God calls his friend? No. Who? No, probably. No. <laughs> Abraham. 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 God is not considering that Noah is his friend. God is actually, uh, there is no connection, right? But, but God, in a way, considers Abraham to be, God, it seems then from this text, right, that God enjoys a good discussion, right? God enjoys it when we challenge it. That's a sign of friendship, right? This is what, this is why, um, I'll be right with you, uh, Maurice, said. this is why, right, you have these texts right? Because the Hebrew religion is not a Noahic religion. It's an Abrahamic religion. We have to shift the mentality. Uh, yes, Maurice, go ahead. Sorry, but didn't do like, okay, I understand from this point of view, he, they challenged God, but when God asked him to kill his son, he just went upstairs and tried to kill him. Yeah, absolutely. So, you have two different Abrahams, right? When it comes yes. to other people, Abraham is ready to jump, right? But when it comes to his own family, he's more careful. And that's, that's another story where, um, which, which has to do with another psychologist. He's very tight. His son is almost like himself. So he doesn't, maybe doesn't feel the need to protect himself. But certainly we have Abraham who is very, very concerned with the welfare of others, right? So that's the, the lesson you have. Um, so yes, Abraham seems to tell us, and, and I like what you're saying, there is a time to submit, but there's sometimes a time to challenge, right? And that's what a real relationship is like. Actually, this is already, you can already get some love advice from Abraham. There are moments in the relationship you should submit and go along, but there are also moments in the relationship that you should challenge. That's what Abraham teaches us, right? And that's what the Hebrew Bible teaches us in the way that it is written. There are moments to surrender and submit. These are the five books of Moses. These are the prophets, but there are also moments where God expects us to challenge and to respond and to question and to ponder and to be frustrated and to express negative emotions, right? That's what we're learning, that true spirituality encompasses the dark side, right? Our humanity is part of the spiritual journey. You can't be truly spiritual if you're not also truly human, right? If you're not in tune with your questions and your doubts and your emotions, right? You can't really be a friend of God. That's what we learn, right? Let me say it again, right? If you're not in tune with your humanity, if you're not in tune with your doubts, your questions, with your revolts, <laughs> with your emotions, even if there are strong and negative emotions, if you're not in tune with those, you cannot really be a friend of God because you're not going to be real. You're not going to be authentic. You're going to be fake, right? And that's the problem. There's a lot of fake people in those churches and in those synagogues, right? So that's the idea, right? These books are there to remind us, be human. Don't neglect the, don't, don't um, bypass your humanity thinking that that will bring you closer to God. And that's what many religions teach. You have to be less than human or more, right? You have to set aside your humanity. Don't ask, don't, don't think, don't question, don't feel, right? Don't rebel, don't cross the line, don't transgress, don't sin. All of this is keeping us, right, from being real. And that's what these texts are reminding us. Yes, it is, there are moments you should submit, but there are moments you should also, in the name of your humanity, challenge right so that's what now so now you're ready right now you're really ready do i still have a hand from morissette or is that from before <clears throat> morissette you still have a question i see your raised hand no no not at all i forgot to okay, very good. okay are you all getting the atmosphere right let me put you on gallery to see if um put your hand out if you're getting the atmosphere right if you're sensing, right, this is very important. You have to really be, um, enter the atmosphere of the family of the books to really understand the Song of Songs. Okay, Soleiman, yes, you have a question. Soleiman, go ahead. No, I was just raising my hand because you can't see me. Uh, so why did you raise your hand? Do you have a question? I tried to put your hand up. If oh, <laughs> thank you, Soleiman. Okay, very good. All right. Now, um, Let's go into briefly the Song of Songs, talk a little bit about Solomon. 
and the, the wisdom literature, uh, wisdom books um, that he wrote. So just so you have an idea who is the author, right, of our text, and we'll see how much time I have. Okay, ooh, not much time. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take about 10 minutes. Um, okay, so Solomon was the king of Jerusalem. He was the third king of Israel. He ruled around the 10th century BC. Um, he was a very interesting king. He was actually uh, uh, the product of a very uh, dark uh, time, very dark event between his father and a woman that uh, he fell in love with who wasn't his wife and who was actually the wife of one of his best friends. Okay, this was what happened, right? His father was King David. King David fell in love with this woman who was not his wife, was the wife of his best friend. So he sends the best friend a uh, close bodyguard of his, right? They fought together, they, they, they were in the trenches together, sends him in the front lines to die so he can take his wife. That's the parents of Solomon, right? So you can imagine, right? You, you're born out of this kind of sin, right? You're born out of this terrible act that your father has committed. <clears throat> imagine the karma, right, that you're carrying. So now it's interesting because Solomon becomes the heir to the throne. It's interesting, he, he, even though David has many, many other sons, he picks Solomon because he is actually a very special child. And we see that in his writings. Solomon is fascinating. He's the only king. There's two things about Solomon, right? Uh, actually, there's one main thing. Solomon is the only king in the whole history of Israel who had connections with his neighbors, friendly connections. All the other kings are constantly fighting with the surrounding nations. Solomon is making treatises. He has connections, deep connections with Egypt. He has connections with the Canaanite regions. He has connection with the North. He has trade routes. And in fact, he's such a cosmopolitan king. He's so well known in the region that you have, and now this is the story perhaps in the background of our text, right? You have a, um, an African queen in the region of today's Ethiopia. Uh, who, was, who was actually considered a wise woman as well as a queen. And she hears about this guy. And this is historical, it's not legend, right? She hears about his so-called wisdom. He's so well known. His, his reputation goes all the way to her. She says, I need to check out this king and ask him a few questions myself and see if he's really worthy of the title of wise man. And she goes up with a caravan of, you know, treasures to offer him, right? She meets Solomon. We don't know what happens, right? But we know that she returns home pregnant, <laughs> right? So she got a lot. She got a lot more than she asked for, right? Um, and she is, in fact, the the ancestor of the Ethiopian Jews, right? That still uh, live in Ethiopia. So you had connection. Now it's interesting because she's an African queen who migrated to, uh, you know, who wanted to meet uh, this uh, king. And our text is also featuring an African woman. And some people have speculated this it's the story between them, kind of retold in a kind of, you know, shepherd, you know, shepherdess type um, setting. Uh, or some people have speculated even that she wrote the book. <laughs> or that some people actually, this is more founded and this actually would work. Some people assume the book might have been written by a woman because it is so powerfully um, uh, lucid with regards to the woman's psychology, right? So, uh, so yeah, and, and, and then of course the author named the book, the author Solomon, right? So it could get through the press and the censure, right? But many, many commentators speculate the author might have actually been a woman, right? Okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, so he wrote this book and what's interesting about this book <clears throat> is that it mirrors a lot of the wisdom, the Egyptian wisdom texts, right? That's why I told you, remember in the introduction, I said it's, it seems like just an erotic poem and they're just describing each other's looks and it seems very superficial. And some of you will actually find the book superficial. You'll be like, oh, why are they just describing their bodies? How, you know, superficial of them, how vain. And it's true, you look at the book and it seems like they're just, you know, complete, uh, what do you call it, um, infatuation, right, with each other's bodies. That this is what the, the feeling you get as you're reading the book, right? But actually what we need to realize so we really understand the book is that this is much more than just a, a nice poem about love. This is a work of wisdom. And so let me explain. In ancient Egypt, um, when you wanted to write a wisdom book where the wisdom was hidden, you would write a love poem, 
and you would write a dialogue between a man and a woman or you would write some kind of erotic poetry and you would hide your wisdom there right so this was a style this was a genre in egyptian literature and and uh, solomon is adopting this genre of the kind of so-called erotic poem which is concealing wisdom and the fact that the woman is at the center is also significant because in ancient egypt the woman was often a symbol for wisdom so if you have a woman speaking and she's doing all of the speaking in a certain work of literature in egypt you know it's a wisdom text because the woman always symbolizes wisdom. So when we read this text in light of the Egyptian literature, and we see a woman center stage doing most of the speaking, the context is love, we know this belongs to the genre of wisdom literature. And so don't be fooled as you're reading by the so-called superficiality or the kind of sensual sensuality of the text. It's all about what they see, touch, feel, smell, right? Um, there is a lot going on and we're going to decipher it together the hidden gems of wisdom within the book there are a lot right um and so when you're reading be sensitive what does this metaphor mean be sensitive to repetitions right when you have certain uh, sentences that repeat it's a clue the author is trying to tell you here pay attention there is a meaning when you have a sentence which repeats but slightly different each time think why what's he trying to say i'm already telling you how to read the text right you want to read attentively uh, yes hakim Yan, go ahead <clears throat> hi um so you mentioned a couple times that solomon's work um alludes to egyptian thought and egyptian literature so my question is like what relationship did he have with them that he's so influenced by them oh thank you for asking me that <laughs> i forgot so yes one of the first alliances uh, solomon did when he became king was with egypt now what's interesting is that he made an alliance that was so powerful that the pharaoh gave him his daughter to marry so he was married to an egyptian his first wife the, the central wife, and then he had a billion concubines and a billion other wives, right? Solomon was a great lover, <laughs> right? But his first wife, and the one we would consider his, the love of his life, was an Egyptian. And now this was a very powerful gesture from the Pharaoh because we know that the Pharaonic line goes through the woman. So if they had had a child, him and this Egyptian princess, that child would have been an heir to the throne of Egypt this is how powerful the alliance was so solomon is well connected with egypt right uh, and certainly well versed in egyptian thought in fact when you read the text you have a lot of egyptian words especially ecclesiastes you have a lot of egyptian expressions directly translated in hebrew right so that's the connection right does that answer your question uh, Hakimian? yes thanks okay very good okay good all right so now you're ready you're ready now you can enter the text and of course what we'll be learning is okay if the lovers break all the rules clearly we're not going to be learning rules right of love like the book the rules we'll be learning something much more important right so i'm leaving it in suspense uh we're going to be learning uh something else another path right there's the path of rules and then there's the other path <laughs> so remember these texts are the scriptures for the lost sheep for those who are not in the fold right those who are not on the path also have their own scripture right and these are their scriptures so we're going to see an alternative path to finding true love right so this should be a relief for a, a, a lot of us who've already messed up <laughs> broken all the rules <laughs> right and now you're like okay now what uh, there is a, there is hope right there is a path for those who have erred and messed up and transgressed there is also a scripture for those and this there is also a path which leads somewhere right we're gonna that's so that's what we're gonna be learning what is the path to true love what is this other path to true love the path which doesn't keep the rules and doesn't walk the line and doesn't follow the you know wisdom of the ancients different path that's what we're going to be learning okay everybody ready <laughs> put your hand if you're ready if you feel like you're ready to enter the book okay very good all right now let's talk a little bit about your next assignment. I was seeing your questions uh, in the um, chat. Um, so yeah, your next assignment is on Thursday, is the reading assignment. Uh, remember that these are, you're gonna be reading the whole Song of Songs. 
I, I will be putting the text, all of the texts on Wednesday, but for now, if you want to start, you can find the old Bible or find it online. Um, so all you have to do is write me a single page, four paragraphs, single spaced, right? Let me write this down again. Uh, no, you haven't had an assignment yet. <laughs> so one page, single spaced, four paragraphs, two questions, two critiques. And remember, this is an assignment you do each time you have a reading. The text, I'm going to post it on um, a blue, uh, what's it called? Blackboard? <laughs> I was going to say Bluetooth. I'm going to post it on my tire. I was going to post it on Blackboard tomorrow. But in the meantime, you can... Um, professor, what do you mean by two question, two critics? Okay, I'm going to explain again then. Uh, so yeah, so as you're reading the book, um, you're going to have some passages that sound strange, like maybe some metaphors. You're going to be like, oh, I wonder what this metaphor means, or I wonder why the author is repeating this line three times, or questions you have as you're reading, or what does this mean? Just you're, you're wrestling with the text, right? And then the two critics, criticisms is you... You don't under, you understand, but you don't agree. Ah, I don't agree with a woman when she says that. I don't agree with a man's behavior. And there's no right or wrong, right? It's you just struggling and with the text. Does that make sense, uh, Maurice? <clears throat> yes. Okay. In any case, I will look over your assignments, and if one is completely not happening, I will tell you, right? But in general, if you do this, it's fine, right? There's no right or wrong. Are uh, questions have to be in paragraph form too? Like if you have a question, like, would it, you would state the question and you would say why it's confusing you? Yeah, in the whole, just the whole paragraph is having the question, why it's confusing you, you try to answer, elaborate, right, okay. on the question. It's all in one paragraph. And then you have a second paragraph like that, and then a third and a fourth for the critics, uh, criticisms. Uh, one page per quote, one page total. Uh, the questions are not on the syllabus because you make them up, <laughs> right? These are questions you have when you're reading the text, right? You're reading and you're like, what does this mean? That's what I want to hear. Okay, you submit it in the Google Drive. So you go to um, Blackboard, you see the menu, and you see tests and assignments, the tab tests and assignments. You go there and good news. I have made it accessible to everyone, even if you don't have a CANS account. So anybody, remember we were struggling yesterday with a few of you, all of you should be able to access it now, whether you're a Queens College student or not. Boom, you're there and you see the different folders and you pick the folder says response, song of songs, and boom, you put it there. Before 4 p.m. tomorrow, because that's when I'm, I mean Thursday, sorry, before, before class basically, before 4 p.m. Um, Thursday, always before class, right? Because I, I need to have them all in by then, by class time, because I read them. While I put you in groups, I read them and I incorporate what you say in the lectures. So I need to have all of them by then, okay? Other questions? <clears throat> Soleiman, you have a question? No. Okay, any other questions? Um, no, I can't post it today. You can find it in any Bible, Hernandez. I'm sure your grandmother has an old Bible somewhere that she would be happy to see you read. Um, or go online and type the Song of Songs, not long. Uh, okay, I'm going to write it down. Write the Song of Songs. That's the, uh, the, the reading. So you can find that anywhere, especially in a, you can go to a Bible online. They have Bibles online. There's no author. <laughs> we don't know the authors. I mean, we speculated, Solomon. It's in the Bible. Okay, in the Bible. You, t you go to bi BibleGateway.com. There. That's an online Bible. You go to BibleGateway.com, and um, that's where you'll find it. Um, so Lopez, there is no specific question. What do you mean, Lopez? <clears throat> oh, hi, how are you, Professor? I would like to know, like, there's no specific question we have to answer, right? Like, we have to make up our own question, our own about the reading, right? Yeah. It's just you um, grappling with the reading. You just like think our about opinion, huh? our point, our, like it's like our point of view. Uh, let me give an example. Um, you're reading the text, right? And you're like, oh, you are like a lily to me. 
And you're like, huh, I wonder why he calls her a lily. What's so specific about the lily? Does the lily have certain characteristics that she has, right? You're just thinking out loud, out loud right? You're just pondering out loud about certain moments in the text. Does that make sense? Understood. Thank you, Professor. Exactly. exactly. Um, good. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Krishna, what's this discussion you're having? <clears throat> Uh, no, it was just a, uh, well, like, like an answer, like to someone's question who asked, like, who wrote uh, the Bible? So I was saying some people think God wrote it, some people think Moses wrote it, and then everyone pretty much disagrees on who could have wrote it, but like, we don't really know, that's all. I wasn't really saying anything. Okay, yes, yes. The Bible doesn't have a specific author. <laughs> Many yeah. authors, right? Very good. So the author for our book, you know, you don't need to know because if you go to BibleGateway.com, you just type in the name of the book, Song of Songs, and it will pop up. Um, so, okay, so just to review, Thursday we meet at four. Make sure you make that class because this class this is class. for everyone. And you want to have your reading assignment in before 4 p.m. on Thursday so I can look at them. Any other questions? Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If you buy the book, like of all of the readings that we're going to do this semester what book is sorry the book of all of the readings that we're going to do during the semester what book is that because i didn't see anything okay so the, the there are several books i i don't give you a big textbook i give you several books by different authors and you have to go to the online qc bookstore to know what they are um to buy them right and if you type in the class um name and or my name you will get um, and so those, uh, you can actually buy for pretty cheap on the QC online bookstore. It shouldn't cost you more than $45 total for all the books, right? And again, I strongly encourage you guys to buy the books because you will want to keep them, right? Uh, other questions? All good. All right. Can I talk to you after class, Professor? Yes, definitely. All right. I'm